Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to all of the Twinfold United Church of Christ, an open and affirming community of faith where no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. And a special welcome on this very first day of spring. We do have a number of announcements to share. Uh, the first being that this month, March, we are collecting items for Chester County Migrant Ministries. Uh, this congregation has a long-standing history with the Migrant Ministries, and we are collecting health kit items. So if you are out shopping or see a sale, we could use anything from washcloths to toothbrushes, toothpaste, razors, deodorants, anything that you could put into a health kit they are in desperate need of. Additionally, this month, we are collecting for the United Church of Christ's One Great Hour of Sharing Offering. This is a very special offering taken across the nation. Although this year, in an effort to save paper, they have not pre-printed special envelopes. All this means is that if you so wish to give, you can either put cash or a check in any envelope, include your giving envelope number, and just write in the memo, one great hour of sharing. Uh, we have a number of announcements regarding Lent and especially Holy Week. We will be having home Sunday services, 8 a.m. in the parking lot, 1015 indoors. On Good Friday, April 15th, we will be having an indoor 7 p.m. tenebrae service. And for those who aren't familiar, our tenebrae service is a very experiential form of worship. It is not a sermon kind of situation. Rather, we slowly dim candles until we are left in darkness to commemorate the darkness felt on the day of Christ's crucifixion. Again, it's an amazing service. All are welcome. And then on Easter morning, we have not one, not two, but three opportunities for worship. Our 8 a.m. Uh, so-called sunrise service will be out in the parking lot, followed by indoor worship services at both 9.30 and 11 a.m. Um, then, <laughs> as if the resurrection isn't exciting enough, the very next week, which is April 24th, we are currently scheduled to enter our next phase of reopening, wherein we once again bubble up the sanctuary capacity, but most importantly, no longer have the social distancing. All of the signs go away. We have ushers, we have um, offering, we have readers, all of which we could use volunteers, by the way. And for those who have been craving coffee hour, we will be once again celebrating coffee hour starting April 24th outside in the grass just um, outside the uh, Fellowship Memorial Hall. So if you are interested in helping with that first coffee hour, again, please contact the church office. As always, we continue to offer our online adult Bible study every Wednesday at 6 p.m. and an online prayer group every Wednesday at 7 p.m. That is an open space that anyone can join. You don't need a computer, you can call on your landline as together we lift up one another and our prayers to God. Seeing as there are no other announcements this morning, oh, there is one other announcement this morning, we will be ordering uh, Easter flowers once again this year. And so I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, lilies are $7, tulips are 6 Yeah, something like that around there. Um, and we will be taking orders if you want them in honor or in memory of someone. Those memorials will appear in the worship guide Easter morning. And if you are interested in ordering Easter flowers, 
you can either speak to or call Sheila Tornetta. There we go. Now, with no further announcements, let's be in the spirit of worship together. Our call to worship is from Psalm 63. O oh God, you are my God, I seek you. My soul thirsts for you, my flesh faints for you. As in a dry and weary land, there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands and call on your name. At this time, let us rise in spirit or in body, and together we sing Amazing Grace. Precious and finite season. 
Instead of making each day worthy of you, we live as if our end will never come. Pardon our pride and turn our eyes to Christ's cross. Amen. The good news of Christ is that there is nothing, not heights, depths, rulers, things present, nor things to come that can keep us from the love of God. In the name of Christ Jesus, our sins are forgiven. Unless you repent, 
you will all perish just as they did. Then Jesus told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and he found none. So he said to the gardener, See here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, then you can cut it down. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Oh, we just heard in our gospel lesson Jesus telling a parable, an allegory, a metaphor story with a moral or a lesson to teach. I think we've all known that Jesus tends to preach a lot in these parables. He told a lot of them, in fact, on his route to Jerusalem, which is why many come up during our Lent journey. Now, to be clear, one of Jesus' best talents was for telling old stories, but changing them a bit and making them new. We see that he did this with scripture all the time. He would quote the Hebrew scriptures like the prophet Isaiah, but then put a new spin to it. I think that's what a lot of our best teachers and preachers do. Now, sometimes... It wasn't scripture Jesus was using. He would actually take a local story, a fable, and make that his own. Jesus could take a story that absolutely everyone thought they knew and give it a whole new meaning. And believe it or not, today's parables was one of those. It wasn't a story that Jesus just came up with on the spot. Rather, it was a story that was in other ancient Near Eastern literature. I think of it a little bit like Aesop's fable of the tortoise and the hare. Now, you may never have read the actual fable about the tortoise and the hare. You may not own a volume of Aesop's fables, but I guess if we pulled the congregation, most of you, would know that slow and steady wins the race. Am I right? You may have been exposed to the story in cartoons or in retellings in our culture. Because of this, we are culturally aware of that story of the tortoise and the hare, even if you never read it. Well, in the ancient Near East, most people were familiar with the time-honored story of the fruitless tree. In fact, it was famously written down in the story of Icar, which was about an Assyrian sage. I'm about to share with you the actual inscriptions of this Assyrian story. It goes, and I spake to Nathan thus, Son, thou hast been to me like a palm tree, which has grown with roots on the bank of the river. When the fruit ripened, it fell into the river. The Lord of the tree came to cut it down, and the tree said, Leave me in this place, that in the next year I may bear fruit. But the Lord of the tree said, up to this day hast thou been to me useless. In the future thou wilt not become useful. I think I like Jesus' version a little better. But if you were able to follow, you had a tree that was not producing fruit. And you had a Lord who wanted to cut it down. The tree begged for one more season to produce fruit. But in the end, the Lord decides the tree is useless and decides to cut it down. Honestly, I feel a little bad for this particular tree. It's not the tree's fault that someone planted it right next to the riverbank. 
But anyway, Jesus took this old familiar story and reimagined it. In it, Jesus' version represents you or me, and the landowner represents God. But there's a new character, the gardener. In Jesus' version, the landowner decided the tree isn't worth the space it's taking up. It's not being productive. It's not doing what it was created to do. And in a sense, we can maybe see the God of Genesis in that storyline, right? The God who would flood the entire earth because humanity had become sinful. Cut it down, God says. I might not have planted it, but at this point it's just wasting space. It's a waste of good soil. It's not doing its job of bearing fruit. So I no longer want it in my vineyard. It's very similar to the Lord in the Assyrian version. The Lord of the tree came to cut it down. Up to this day, thou hast been to me useless. In the future, thou wilt not become useful. But then, Jesus changes the story. Suddenly, there's this gardener, this worker who knows the tree personally and speaks on behalf of this tree. Sir, let it alone just for one more year. And so I dig around it and try to fertilize it. See, in Jesus' version, there's someone to speak up for that poor, unfruitful tree. The tree gets an advocate. And if you notice, the gardener doesn't try to make excuses for the tree. Oh, the weather's been bad, you know, the, the climate and the soil. No. The gardener never makes excuses for the tree. Instead, he offers to put in his own time, his own effort and work. This gardener, this advocate, is willing to pay out of his own pocket for the fertilizer, do the backbreaking work of digging all around the roots, and is willing to give up his time to try and make this tree fruitful. Why? Why spend his limited time and resources on this waste of a tree? Folks, it's because that's who Jesus is. And that's what Jesus does. And it doesn't make logical, rational sense for Jesus to advocate for us any more than that gardener for that one tree. In many ways, we waste the wonderful lives that God has planted us in. I mean, we're supposed to, as Christians, produce fruits of the Spirit. We're supposed to be radical beacons of generosity, open-mindedness, forgiveness, compassion, and faith. People out there are supposed to look at us and be astounded. They're supposed to see the ways that we live the words we speak, notice that's different and realize that there's truly something special about this person. They're supposed to see our great patience, forgiveness, and kindness in a world out there that is often nasty, selfish, fearful. We're supposed to set a different example that makes people go, wow, and pay attention. Because, guys, that is how we convert people to God. Not by banging on doors or lecturing, browbeating, or even acting holier than thou. Not by making a spectacle of our faith. But rather, people become curious and interested in having a relationship with God when they see how radically different our lives look. When they see what an impact God has had on your life. And that is the fruit that we're all supposed to be producing. And yet, season after 
seas that we do keep coming up empty, wasting the soil as the parable goes. Instead of growing integrity, there's gossip, mean-spiritedness, grudges, holding on to anger. Instead of open-minded compassion or empathy, we have stubbornness, fear, and instead of selfless generosity, we can be preoccupied with wanting things our way, having as much as possible, closing our fists and holding on to power. Instead of kindness, meekness, and gentleness, we can be angry and aggressive. Folks, all of us are like that tree. And the landowner, despite having made us, sees us as sometimes taking up space and not bearing fruit. But like the fruit tree, we get an advocate. That gardener is Jesus Christ. Jesus comes alongside us and speaks on our behalf. Jesus intercedes with God. Give them a one more chance. Let me go to them. Let me spend time and effort. Maybe they'll be fruitful. Maybe if I give my life. Now all the other gods and demigods of the ancient Near East would have just cut us down. But we have a caretaker in Christ. We have an advocate to speak on our behalf, to help us when we fall short. We have someone willing to put in the time, effort, and love that we all need to come around. The question then is, do we come around? As Jesus also tells another parable, where a man is forgiven much, but in return, refuses to forgive others. I think a good measure of all of our fruitfulness is whether we're willing to be gardeners and advocates for others. I want you to take a moment and honestly ask yourself this question. Is there somebody in your life who you feel isn't worth the soil? Is there an entire group or a segment of society who you think isn't worth the soil? Someone who has lost their right to be in our vineyard. Is there any one person or any huge category of people you can think of who just feel unworthy or even a waste of our time? Someone who has lost or never even earned the privilege of being a productive member. Because I think the true measure of whether we're being fruitful for God is whether we are willing to give up our time, our resources, and our compassionate concern for those other trees out there that might be about to be cut down. Why? That's because the good news is that Christ doesn't cut us down. In Christ, no one is deemed worthless or too far gone. In Christ, no one is considered too wrong, too sinful, or too much of a lost cause. Our gardener and advocate loves each tree loves each of us even more than in his own life. It's good news and a great gift. So this third week of Advent, let's try to be worthy of it. Amen. One way that we can be gardeners to one another is being advocates and interceding to God, even for those whom we hold grudges, even for those we hold anger, even for those we consider enemies. We turn our hearts now to God in prayer, for we celebrate with God the joys in our lives and to offer God our intercessions, remembering confidentiality, so we may not preferably use last names in order to honor one another. Uh, 
people that there is new life beginning to spring forth, blossoms on trees, bulbs sprouting, birds singing. And so we give thanks to God for the cycle of new life that we are entering. There were prayers raised this morning for those who are still struggling with COVID. I know that while we are doing quite well here, um, throughout Europe and Asia, many nations are in the worst throes of the virus as there is a new sub-variant. And so we ask prayers for those and everyone here who is still struggling with this illness or dealing with the symptoms of long COVID. There were many, many prayers spoken this morning over the situation in Ukraine. And so today we pray multiple prayers. We ask that God provide safety for those civilians in Ukraine who are facing attack. We ask that God be with all of the refugees, now over three million, who have had to leave the homes that they love and have built, the jobs that they take pride in, and the people they care about. We ask prayers for all of the people in all of the nations that are welcoming refugees, who have opened their gates and their borders, have opened their arms and provided food, shelter, and relief to those who are fleeing. And finally, trying to be good partners, we pray for each and every Russian and Russian soldier, remembering that any conflict like this is bound to cause trauma and moral injury to those fighting it. In addition, we pray for many of our members and friends. Today, we continue to pray for Scott, that God be with him and give him strength and comfort. We pray for Merle, who is awaiting a transplant. We pray for Deb for chronic pain and other issues. We pray for Jenny and our other shut-ins. We pray for Marianne as she continues cancer treatments. We pray for Dane, his brother Chris, and their father who had a procedure this week. We pray for Tony's mother, Connie, as well as Donna. We continue to pray for Lane who is recovering from stroke. Are there other prayer requests to lift up this morning? Yes. For my friend Susan, that um, she healed. We pray for Susan this morning, prayers of healing. Are there others? Yes. Uh, for Jerry, who just got out of the hospital. Jerry? And for Art, who unfortunately died in Hermione for a May 4th and all right, so there are prayer requests for Jerry, who has just recently got out of the hospital. But there's also prayers for the family of Art, who has just died of COVID. And we ask that God welcome him into the church triumphant and comfort all of those who love him. Yes? My name is Father, who's struggling with grief. I love her, her father and Eric, who is struggling with the nation. All right, so who's the first one, Holly? We pray for Holly in her grief this day, that God comfort her, and we also pray for Eric, who is struggling with the illness of addiction. Others. I ask prayers for Phil, Felix, who is going to be having in the next few weeks a a computation hearing over his juvenile death sentence, uh, life sentence. And so we ask prayers uh, for him and for that board. Are there any others? Yes. Uh, Barbara, for healing. We pray for Barbara and ask God for our healing upon Barbara. All right. Seeing no others, let's be in the spirit of prayer. Gracious and loving God, we are so grateful that you sent us Christ to literally come alongside us, walk with us, and find out exactly what we need to be fruitful. Help us to do the same for one another.
another we pray. God, hear all of these prayers that we've lifted up on our tongues this morning and all those we might be quietly carrying in our hearts. We ask healing in body for all those who are suffering from everything from chronic pain to seasonal allergies, Lord, help us be well. We pray for healing in mind and spirit. Be with those dealing with memory loss or dementia, grief or depression, anxiety, thoughts of suicide. Lord, be ever present with those dealing with addiction of any kind or eating disorders. Lord, finally, we ask for peace in the name of Christ, the Prince of Peace. We pray for those in Ukraine and on the border with Russia. But we also pray for the street corners of Philadelphia, where angry guns preach a gospel full of hate. Be with us and heal us, we pray, in the name of our Savior, our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Let us rise in spirit or body for our final hymn in the cross of Christ I glory. 